Hello, my name is Adrian Del Maestro, and this is a, a video of uh, a March meeting talk I was going to give J66, talk three, on theory of the pair breaking quantum phase transition in superconducting nanowires. I'm from the University of Vermont, and this is work that was supported by the National Science Foundation. And this work is, is really a report on a joint theory and, and experimental effort with my colleagues, uh, Benjamin and Andre, who would have been giving talks in this session. And it's a shame that uh, I wasn't there and we weren't there to, to see each other's talks altogether. All right, so as I said, this work has a long history. Uh, there's a long collaboration that's been very fruitful and, and quite a bit of literature that's generated, uh, been generated. Um, at the beginning, it was work done in collaboration with Subir Sashtev and, and Baron Rosenau, and Anna Shah joined uh, for some work, uh, Marcus Mueller, and then Thomas Boita and Jose Hoyos worked on, on the disorder problem, and that was uh, quite some time ago. And more recently, Andre Rorschef and, and Benjamin Sassafe, uh, worked on an experiment that really realized the physical situation that we were originally interested in, in talking about a quantum phase transition between a superconductor and a metal in this kind of quasi 1D um, nanowire geometry. And with that new realization, kind of reinvigorated the theoretical effort uh, to see if we could actually use the universal predictions that we had made to actually understand what they were seeing in the laboratory. And as I mentioned, all, all funding came to the National Science Foundation, um, and there's a number of number of papers, um, quite a few, quite a bit of literature on this topic. All right, so there's really two ingredients here. The first is dimensional confinement, uh, a small diminutive superconductor. So what do I mean by that? I mean some physical geometry whereby we can confine or squeeze the condensate wave function such that the, that direction of confinement, let's say the diameter of a wire, is smaller or at least on the order of the length scale that uh, characterize the coherence of the Cooper pairs, in this case, something like a zero temperature Ginsburg Landau coherence length. So that's one important piece. However, for unpaired fermions, uh, we want this wire to still behave like a normal metallic wire with many transverse channels. So we demand that the inverse Fermi wavelength, so the inverse Fermi wave vector, KF inverse, uh, is much, much smaller than, let's say, the diameter of the wire. So we're squeezing the quantum wave function, but the, the regular unpaired fermions are still in some three-dimensional system, they have some three-dimensional density of states. So that's the first piece. So we, we might have a, a confined superconductor, but then we add some term that introduces pair breaking. And by pair breaking, I mean some type of phenomena, uh, there'll be many, um, that essentially makes it uh, splits the, the up and down member, spin up and spin down member of, of a Cooper pair. In this case, we're gonna consider a magnetic field which introduces this new energy scale, which we call the pair breaking energy scale, H bar alpha, uh, which for the case of magnetic field has this form. But the physics that we're gonna discuss uh, is actually turns out to be very generic for a bunch of different types of pair breakers. Um, once we have some type of relax relaxation, relaxation mechanism, and this pair breaker will really act as like an effective frictional force on, on the Cooper pairs. And we're gonna try to understand the interplay of these two phenomena and, and how they um, how they how they work together to form some interesting behavior. So as a, as a brief outline, I'll start with a discussion of the field theory for a pair breaking superconductor to metal transition. Uh, the metal piece of that turns out to be quite important that we have these uh, transverse channels for electrical transport. Um, in particular, we'll talk about fluctuation conductivity near a quantum phase transition, um, what the presence of this quantum critical point uh, between the superconductor and the metal does to our expectations for transport. We'll try to develop a sort of universal theory that applies in, in one spatial dimension. And then in the second part, uh, we'll focus on the particular case of, of transport and superconducting nanowires. As I mentioned, we'll take our universal theory and try to connect it to make predictions uh, for what we'd expect in the laboratory. And then time permitting, I'll discuss some effects of disorder and dimensionality and, and some more recent works and directions. All right, so let's start with this, this field theory. Uh, well, it begins with one of sort of the, the original um, discussions of a quantum phase transition. That's the abrakosov gorkov theory of, of pair breaking and superconductors. And so why, why would we consider this to be interesting? Well, for a regular superconductor in the absence of pair breaking, um, even a dirty superconductor, we know that there's some uh, zero, there's some uh, critical temperature, which I've called uh, TC naught over here. Um, and below TC naught, we just get a normal superconductor. Um, BCS's theory will always have a super, uh, superconducting state whenever there's any finite pairing interaction. And all the way down at zero temperature, all superconducting fluctuations really cease, and we have a pretty boring superconductor. 
All right, so how do we get a, a quantum phase transition? Well, we turn on this pair breaking energy scale, which as I said, kind of splits the up and down uh, spin components or uh, plus P and minus P uh, components of the Cooper pair, introduces this extra energy scale and now provides this uh, a scale whereby which we can actually destroy the, the superconductor. So we get a TC that's described by uh, this equation here um, in terms of the, the zero pair breaking TC naught, this size just the, the poly gamma function. Um, and now we have this transition between a superinductor and a, met, uh, a metal. So the original calculation was done for uh, magnetic impurities, but it turns out that, as I said, provided that there's some kind of dissipation mechanism available uh, to decohere the, the, uh, the, the Cooper pair, um, this phenomena is very generic to all kinds of pair breaking situations, geometries, for example, thin films, wires and magnetic fields, like I'll talk about here, but also magnetic impurities, spatially varying BCS coupling, proximity effects, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and an interesting uh, thing that I'll point out is, is the, the citation for this paper down here, which appears in all the textbooks and all the famous papers, um, appears actually that one cannot uh, get this from the, the JTP website. Um, this, this reference does not actually exist in, in, on the JTP website, and, and I, uh, one can't find a PDF of, of this translated into English. So if you have thoughts on that or you know where this thing is, please uh, send me an email. Okay, so what we're interested in actually is the nature of the crossovers and you have this quantum phase transition at alpha equals alpha C in, in one spatial dimension. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about extensions to two spatial dimensions, but that's really gonna be our interest is how do we understand the, the uh, signatures of this? What effects does it have on transport? Can we describe uh, this physics in kind of a universal way? All right, so what do we know about the low temperature fluctuation conductivity of metals? It turns out we know a lot. Uh, this is kind of textbook uh, Altshuler Aronoff, Aronoff uh, behavior. And um, we have various contributions due to the fact that we have this superconducting uh, phase nearby, and, and there's all kinds of measurable uh, properties of that. These were uh, spelled out very beautifully in a series of papers uh, by Na Nana Shah and coworkers in 2005 and 2007. Uh, there's really three different contributions that be can be computed in, in perturbation theory for dirty, dirty uh, electrons near the superinducting transition. Um, and the first ones that I'll talk about are uh, ones that, that are relevant at, at zero temperature in the metallic phase, uh, the so-called density of states and, uh, and Mackey-Thompson corrections. So these actually lead at zero temperature um, to a negative magneto resistance. So what do I mean by that? So the, the fluctuation correction, so here by delta sigma, I mean, these are the corrections uh, to this background metallic conductivity that I mentioned before. Well, it turns out that at zero temperature, these actually increase as we move away uh, from the, the quantum phase transition, hence the, the negative magneto resistance. And you know, these are uh, these types of questions, uh, contributions, Mackey Thompson and, and density of states are related to the depletion of, uh, of the density of states and, and also coherent and drave scattering off, off Cooper pairs. Um, so the interesting thing about these corrections is they're actually dangerously irrelevant in, in sort of a renormalization group sense. So what do I mean by that? Uh, they dominate at low temperatures, but they actually disappear at the quantum critical point when alpha equals alpha C. Um, so we can actually safely ignore them in the quantum critical regime, which will turn out to be up here. Uh, and um, okay, so what about this last type of correction as Lazimov Larkin? Uh, this is going to play an important role at, at higher temperature. So now we're up here in, in the metallic phase. So these as Lazimov Larkin corrections are sort of the, the direct contribution of Cooper pairs to this fluctuation conductivity. So I have approximate superconducting state, I have pairing fluctuations. Um, and these can contribute to, to, to transport via just direct charge transport, um, direct charge transfer. And in this perturbation theory, what one finds, at least at low temperatures, is that the resulting contribution away from the critical point should scale like T squared. Uh, the, uh, the leading critical fluctuations vanish at, uh, at T equals zero for all alpha greater than alpha C. And we'll argue that, that these contributions are actually included in our quantum field theory. Uh, we can fully understand them and we can reproduce these types of corrections. Uh, but we note that uh, you know, this kind of behavior predicts potentially some type of uh, non-monotonic temperature dependence of the conductivity and, and we're gonna search for that in our theory. All right, so, so what are we gonna use to describe uh, this transition? So we're interested in a phase diagram that looks like the following. Uh, so we have a, a, a phase transition between a superconductor and a metal at zero temperature described by this quantum critical point. And we're interested in being able to understand all of the, the physical behavior throughout this quantum critical regime. Uh, 
So the first step in the presence of pair breaking is a theory of so-called Couperon fluctuations. So these are just diffu diffusive Cooper pairs um, in the presence of pair breaking described by the strength of this pair breaking fre frequency alpha right here. Um, and we describe the Cooper pairs just by a complex order parameter psi. Uh, they have some diffusion constant D right here, um, and the effects of dissipation due to the pair breaking, the fact that we imagine we have this bath of unpaired electrons due to the pair breaking. And so as a Cooper pair travels down the wire, it can actually disassociate and become part of this bath. Um, that's what leads to this, the strength of this dissipation term here. So this theory actually looks very non-standard. Um, if one asks, you know, under renormalization group transformation, how do I ensure isotropic scaling of this theory? Well, that requires that we have a dynamical critical exponent z equals two. This means in this quantum critical regime that space and time don't scale the same way. Now, of course, for a condensed matter system, that's totally reasonable. We don't need to have a relativistic quantum field theory where z would be equal to one, but that really has a lot of effects on the physics. It means that the effective dimensionality of our system is not d plus one as it would be in a relativistic system, but the effective classical system looks like d plus two. So that means if we ask then, are interactions important, interactions between Cooper pairs in this theory? Well, now we know just from a simple uh, mean field that um, interactions will be, will be important below the, uh, the upper critical dimension, which is basically four. So here, because of this addition to the extra dimension, now interactions are gonna be important below D equals two. So we have to include this kind of self-interaction between Cooper pairs, um, and it'll turn out that this will be very important and we'll have a large uh, modification to the theory. So such an action can be derived from first principles for uh, uh, anisotropic gap superconductors or in the presence of, of pair breakers, um, and lots of work has, has been done on this. Okay, so what about this D equals one case that we're interested in? Well, in D equals one, turns out that this theory just reduces to the sort of famous Langerma, Gokar, McCumber, Halperin, or, or LAMH theory, uh, which describes a mean field critical temperature. That's this dashed line right here that you'd expect for a narrow superconductor, tin whiskers, uh, tin wires, things like that, um, where uh, where basically the effect of this dissipation uh, it just uh, shows up here in having some random thermal noise or, or Langevin noise. This is the, the dissipation um, that's coming into play. And uh, uh, so, okay, so how do we understand this? Well, it turns out that, you know, let's say I have some finite resistance in a superconductor. In the kind of uh, Lando Ginsburg theory, that means that the, uh, you know, describing within the Josephson relation, I would have the, the, uh, the number of lines or the number of turns of this helix describing that the phase of the order parameter would continue to increase. Um, I need to somehow dissipate that energy. So Little came up with a, a, an answer for this a long time ago, that essentially if at some point along the 1D system, the, we can suppress the, the amplitude of the order parameter to zero, then we can basically unwind one turn or have a two pi phase slip uh, of the order parameter, which allows us at constant voltage to see a resistance even in, in a superconductor. Um, so these amplitude fluctuations are gonna be very important. And this works extremely well to describe the behavior of, uh, of uh, thin superconductors. Um, but notice if we look here, the difference between the radius and the ginsburg lander coherence leg, these type of wires are not really 1D in terms of my definition of, of one dimension. They're sort of quasi one dimension where the radius is on the order of or actually greater than, uh, than the superconducting coherence leg. Um, so we're interested in, in what happens at, uh, at lower, um, lower radii, much more narrow wires. So here's the picture. Uh, we're gonna focus on a one dimensional case. This is the phase diagram that we'd like to understand things in between a fluctuating superconductor and a metal. We'd like to describe transport within this complete quantum critical regime. Um, so we basically have dissipative interacting Cooper pairs uh, with an order parameter that's subject to both thermal and quantum uh, phase and amplitude fluctuations. And having those amplitude fluctuations is quite important for describing the proximate metal as opposed to let's say a phase only theory uh, of let's say a couple Josephson junctions um, that would describe a superconductor to insulator transition. And here the phase slips that I just spoke about uh, that can now be driven by quantum or thermal fluctuations show up as the ability to have amplitude fluctuations of, of this order parameter. So we're really interested in doing two things. The first is, is to predict transport properties, and the second is to connect to these molybdenum germanium nanowire experiments in a magnetic field. So that's what we'll move on to right now. If we make universal predictions with this theory, can we then uh, understand what you might expect to see in the lab if we, uh, if we turn on a magnetic field or some type of pair breaker? All right, so what do we expect in, in this kind of wire case? 
Uh, so again, we're interested in, in uh, making a computation of transport everywhere inside this orange region right here. So the first thing we can do is just simple dimensional analysis. So the fluctuation corrections to the DC connectivity. So again, by this, I mean we subtract off the background contribution of just having the, the uh, perpendicular channels in the wire. Um, we're not interested in the, met the metallic conductivity. We just want to know what is the effect of the quantum critical point on uh, corrections to the DC conductivity. Well, then the prediction just from dimensional analysis in 1D is that the conductivity is uh, 40 squared over H times the length. 40 squared, because here we're interested, we have as Lasma Flarker corrections, which means that our transport is being corrected uh, by Cooper pairs with charge 2e. Okay, so what's this length? Well, if we're at alpha equals alpha c, so we're right above uh, the quantum critical point right here, then there's no length scales in the problem for the DC connectivity, omega is zero, k is equal to zero, so the only possible energy scale that we have around is temperature. And so temperature then sets the relevant length scale that has to be there, and that's some kind of thermal length right here. Uh, this uh, is scaled to the power of one over z, where z is this dynamical critical exponent that we found uh, to be two. So if you don't believe me, well, this thing is joules times second times the diffusion constant, uh, which has um, units of meters squared per second. And then we divide by a, an energy scale, take the square root, and the resulting term has lengths of, or has dimensions of meters. So indeed, this thing is a, a length scale. Okay, so this is, a, this is a prediction. What about away from alpha equals alpha c? Well, as soon as we move away from alpha equals alpha c, now we have another length scale, which is, of course, the correlation length. We know this thing is gonna diverge at alpha equals alpha c. And so the resulting conductivity, or correction to the conductivity, will just be this e squared over h times the length, which is the thermal length here. And now we modify this by some universal scaling function whose argument is a ratio of the two length scales in the problem, this thermal length, and now uh, this, uh, this correlation length set by the distance to the critical point. So if one sticks in some values, what we find is the following, uh, where this, the argument of the scaling function up to some dimensionful constants right here um, just looks scales with the distance from the critical point raised to this correlation length critical exponent nu over temperature to the one over z. And so the behavior, we can study uh, the, the um, behavior of this universal function phi, and that should then give us, if we can understand this, what the, the temperature dependence of the conductivity should be. All right, so we'd like to do transport calculations, but we have a big problem. So we have these fluctuating dissipative Cooper, Cooper pairs described by this complex order parameter psi, uh, which depends on, on uh, k and, and omega at finite temperature, but we have to worry in d equals one about the fact that there's interactions between them. These, these Couperon fluctuations actually repel each other, and that's difficult to do. What, how are we going to deal with this interaction term? Um, we just showed that below the upper critical dimension, perturbation theory should break down at some point. Um, so one approach that we can take, which is sort of a self-consistent mean field approach um, that allows us to deal with interactions, is called the large n limit. So what we do is we generalize our complex field psi, which would have two real components, to instead having n such components. In that limit, we can actually, as I said, self-consistently um, explain or describe uh, the interactions going on. Uh, when one does that and, and solves this theory within, by solving I and mean, compute the partition function essentially, uh, we find that uh, z is equal to two, that's the dynamical critical exponent, we already uh, realized that, and what we get is that this new, the, the correlation and critical exponent that sets how the correlation length diverges as we approach the transition is equal to one. And that's very different than the case where we set the interactions to be zero, um, or imagine that they're, they're weak and non-existent, in which case we would predict that nu is equal to half. So this is a testable prediction of the theory, the, the, how, the, the, uh, um, how this length scale diverges. And so then what we can do is, if within this large n approximation, which I said is self-consistent, we can then do computations and compute expectation values, correlation functions. In particular, we can calculate the DC conductivity via the Kupo formula, where we just take, uh, evaluate this, this correlation function. It's a current, current correlator. Here's the current, just depends on the spatial behavior um, of, of this complex order parameter, which now again has n components. And what we find is that we're actually able to predict the full numerical scaling form of this, uh, this uh, scaling function phi sigma, which de defines the conductivity. So this variable y here is a ratio of this LT over sigma. Um, when y is positive, we're in the metallic phase, and when y is negative, we're in the, the superconducting phase. All right, so this is not particularly useful at this stage, if we actually want to predict transport. So now let's convert this into some units uh, that are much more useful to try to understand the transport problem. So we can make kind of universal transport predictions everywhere inside this quantum critical regime. So now we have z equals two, we have nu equals one. 
as shown here. And here's my expression where now I know at least numerically this full scaling function phi. So what's the first prediction? Well, the first prediction is, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we're able to reproduce the results of perturbation theory where it might be relevant. And indeed, we find that. So we find that at, at low temperatures in the metallic phase, we indeed find this T squared behavior divided by the distance from the critical point to some large power here. Um, but at higher temperatures in the quantum critical regime where this theory, the perturbation theory should break down, we find some one over square root of temperature dependence. Uh, so that actually predicts which we'll see in a second, this non-monotonic temperature dependence that I was mentioning before, where first we uh, increase um, and then eventually decrease uh, when we're in the metallic phase, the fluctuation conductivity correction. So that's the first prediction, this non-monotonic T dependence. What about if we're directly above the quantum critical point? Well, we kill this other spatial length scale and we make a prediction that at finite temperatures, we get E squared over H times this thermal length, so it should scale like one of our square root T. And we have a universal number uh, for the scaling function, which we predict to be on the order of uh, a 0 0.2. And I worked very hard a long time ago um, to actually compute not just this number, but the effects of this large n approximation that we make. So what happens if we introduce that the number of components of the order parameter is not two real components, but is, in, uh, is not infinity or large, uh, but is instead two, we can systematically compute corrections and find that indeed the corrections to this number fall off quite, uh, quite quickly. There's a very small correction. So it's 0.2 plus some little value in the, uh, in the physical case. Okay, so what are our predictions? So this is a log log plot of the fluctuation conductivity, this correction delta sigma as a function of temperature. Well, indeed in the metallic regime, first we predict that it grows like one of our square root of T at low temperatures um, and then actually decreases like T squared. So that's prediction number one when we're over here in the metallic phase. Directly at the quantum critical point, um, we just increase like one of our square root of T. And in the superconducting regime, where now we have large Zosnoff Larkin corrections, we get a divergent contribution to the fluctuation conductivity that goes like one over T squared. So these are the universal predictions in these three regimes ever in the phase diagram. And so this is kind of where things stood 10 years ago. Uh, we would have liked to be able to have an experiment at that time to predict these, um, but that experiment didn't exist yet. And so this work just kind of sat. And I was always hoping uh, that eventually such experiments would be done. So now Andre Rogoshev uh, sends me an email and says, Adrian, uh, we have these nanowires we can grow, molybdenum and germanium nanowires. Uh, they're very small. They have diameters in the order of 25 nanometers or can be made even smaller. They're truly in the 1D limit. If we compare to the, uh, the zero temperature ginsburg lannard coherence length, we satisfy this. So these are really 1D wires in the way we were thinking. And when they measured the resistance as a function of temperature in these wires, so here is decreasing temperature, what they saw is a beautiful example of this quantum phase transition. So at low fields, they basically see the resistance drop down to zero. Then they have some behavior where even they're seeing something non-monotonic. For large fields, they're well in this metal phase um, where the, the resistance is increasing. Now, another important thing that they saw is that above some field, in this case about 6.5 Tesla, then there's essentially no more field dependence of the connectivity anymore. So that allows them systematically to be able to subtract off this background metallic component, which they claim is just the value here, where they no longer see any field effect to the, uh, to the connectivity. And so they can directly compute this delta sigma, uh, the fluctuation connectivity to the um, uh, due to the, the proximate quantum phase transition that we have these predictions for. Okay, but we have everything in terms of these very esoteric units, pair breaking frequency, um, you know, what, what do they actually have in the lab? So this is the prediction that we have for the fluctuation connectivity. We know the scaling function numerically. Um, we know Z equals two and U equals one, or those are our predictions for our theory. Um, so what we'd like to do is be able to connect this to the microscopic nanowires picture. Now we can do that using what we know about the ginsburg landau theory for an effectively 1D superconductor um, with details in this Tucker and Halpern paper, where we know that the argument of this scaling function should just be the ratio of these two length scales, so it should be dimensionless. So one can work hard and figure out exactly what that, uh, what this uh, dimensionless variable should be. And it turns out it depends on things like the interaction strength and the diffusion constant, the strength of dissipation and so on. And there's some non-universal constant C, which we can't predict in the theory um, for this a particular microscopic configuration. This comes from the fact that interactions actually shift the location of the quantum critical point away from uh, the bare alpha C that we would have in the non-interacting theory. So at this point, there's basically one, one constant that we don't know. 
and then we can connect fully connect to the microscopic nanowire situation. We can compute the diffusion constant, the interaction parameter dissipation, and most importantly, due to, to uh, longstanding work, we can actually uh, convert for this particular ge geometry, this pair breaking frequency alpha minus alpha C into the magnetic field in the laboratory. And another thing that's amazing is although there's a geometric factor here coming from whether the, the magnetic field is perpendicular or parallel to the wire, the thing that's, that's breaking the pairs, um, written in this, this form here, it turns out that that geometric factor exactly cancels. So in all of this, if we can compute BC, the critical field, which can be done just by looking for uh, curve crossing as predicted, then we can actually um, exactly uh, plot this scaling function from laboratory data. So that's what Andre did. Uh, so this is a plot of the conductance scaled in the appropriate way um, based on no. So I looked at wires, uh, these nanowires, where the magnetic field was both parallel but also perpendicular, and a bunch of different nanowires that they fabricated with slightly different radii and properties. Um, and what Andre found is remarkable agreement with the quantum critical theory described by this black solid line in both of these curves. So essentially, this is the result of uh, a lot of data, data collapse both in the metallic regime, which is down here, and the superconducting regime, which is up here, which maybe doesn't work as well for this particular wire, which is a little bit thinner, and the subtraction may not have worked as well, where for these wires, we're computing all of these microscopic parameters of the wire, and then obtaining data collapse via just a single parameter C, which turns out, as I said, to be uh, about 0.05. So this is pretty remarkable agreement uh, for these different wires, different field directions, everything um, behaves exactly as described by the quantum critical theory. So I think this is, this is really a remarkable confirmation uh, to find this data collapse over orders of magnitude and temperature. Again, this is the scaling function as a function of this reduced scaling variable um, using dynamical critical exponent z equals two and the correlation length exponent nu equals one. Using the non-interacting value of nu equals a half does not lead to, uh, to data collapse and, and fit. Um, there's uh, quite a bit of confirmation of universality here. We're talking multiple wires and field directions, so that's quite remarkable. Uh, one can actually use the theory in a fully predictive fashion. So this is that original data I showed you, where now we even actually plot a curve uh, predicted by the theory where there is no experimental data and see how, uh, how consistent it is. And we even see this, this non-monotonic behavior predicted by the theory and get this uh, rather interesting expression or validate this very interesting expression for the transport. And the final thing is this universal number at the above the critical point, which we compute both at order uh, n equals infinity, but also uh, subsequent to corrections, um, which you know, is, is basically two loop. And we find agreement with the experiment over multiple wires and multiple field, field directions on the order of about 50%. Uh, so this is, I think, rather remarkable uh, prediction um, for the, the universality of this phase transition. Okay, so that's the, the 1D case. I think that forms a rather nice picture that indeed we are in the pair breaking universality class, um, but what about disorder and dimensionality? And the acute amongst you um, would say, you know, what about disorder? If I look at the Harris criterion, here the product of nu times D, which is one, is clearly less than two. And so the Harris criterion would predict that disorder should be relevant. And our theory so far has, has completely been for a, a clean set of wires. Um, but we can kind of understand that in terms of that this pair breaking theory should only be really applicable provided the temperature is above some disorder temperature. So how could we find that disorder temperature? Well, we can basically equate the relevant length scales, this thermal length scale with a, a length scale coming from disorder, which is just the mean free path times the number of perpendicular channels in the, or transverse channels in the wire. And when we do that, we find a disorder strength that for the wires in question is about two millikelvin. And the experiments that Andre performed are always above that. And so in the regime that the experiments are, we can basically neglect the effects of disorder. So that's good. Um, but what about at very low temperatures or when disorder becomes uh, applicable, then we would really have to modify the theory uh, to basically allow all of our coupling constants, the diffusion, dissipation, this pair breaking parameter, and even interna interactions to be functions of position along the wire. That turns out to be a rather difficult thing to do, um, but we looked at that a number of years ago. And one of the things that motivated us to do that was some really beautiful strong disorder renormalization group calculations done by uh, Jose Hoyos and, and Thomas Boita and collaborators. 
essentially they performed a real space renormalization group calculation uh, for the z equal to theory that, that uh, we're describing. And the real space RG essentially in a disordered system, one just looks for the, the most dominant energy scale at each step of, of the, the procedure and eliminates that and, and gets effective couplings. Um, one can eliminate in, in the simple case of, of the Fisher's uh, renormalization group for a random transit field icing model, one can eliminate strong fields uh, forming a new bond or a strong bond um, getting a, a new field. So what happened uh, when they did that calculation, they predicted the following phase diagram, which is heavily modified from, uh, from the clean case, where they predict actually flow to an infinite randomness fixed point. Um, so this is a rather remarkable prediction that they made that the dirty superconductor to metal transition not only flows to infinite randomness, that means strong disorder is important, uh, everything depends on, on rare regions, um, but it actually it's in the same universality class as the ferromagnetic tr transition in the random transit field icing model. So one is discrete symmetry, one is continuous symmetry. Um, this is a pretty shocking prediction. So what we did is, is uh, numerically, performed a numerical solution of this pair breaking action in some self-consistent manner at large n and actually confirmed this prediction that indeed uh, we saw not only this strongly activated scaling. So in the clean system, we expect some temporal length scale to scale like the distance from the critical point uh, to some uh, parameter to, the, uh, to z, the, the dynamical critical exponent. But instead of that, we actually see this highly uh, anisotropic activated scaling where it's so slow it scales like the exponential of the spatial correlation length to some, uh, some exponent psi. We're actually able to extract those exponents and we found indeed they're fully consistent with the random transverse field icing model. So strong disorder rare regions are really important here. How should we understand that? Well, I think the easiest way is in this nanowire, if we happen to have a region that's either, either strongly superconducting or strongly normal, then that will completely dominate all of this fluctuation conductivity effects to the wire. So maybe from that point of view, it's not so surprising, but this was a nice numerical confirmation of that. All right, what about higher dimensions? Well, now our interaction should be marginal, right? We're in D equals two. Uh, interaction should be marginal, but still uh, can be included. Um, just again, dimensionally, the fluctuation conductivity should be E squared over H times some constant with maybe logarithmic corrections. This has been looked at a little bit in the past. Uh, we're interested in, in pursuing this further and see if we can understand, is there a pair breaking universality class transition in, for example, dirty films, superconducting films, and, and Andre um, is gonna talk about that. Uh, this is, you know, the 2D case has been has been studied quite a lot and there's a lot that we can learn um, from the literature out there. So there's lots more for us to do um, on that. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, we studied the superconductor to metal transition and found that it indeed is in the pair breaking universality class. What does that mean? Uh, basically, we need to include both amplitude and phase fluctuations of our Cooper pair order parameter that is strongly interacting. Um, we have a dynamical exponent z equals two due to the dissipation. So we're actually in an effectively higher dimension. Uh, the, the classical model lives in, in an effectively higher dimension. We could use the universality predict by that theory to actually study uh, the field tuned quantum phase transition in superconducting nanowires, which was done in the lab. This experiment came about 10 years after the original theory, which again is a rather remarkable thing uh, that the, the time from prediction uh, to, uh, to confirmation in the lab was on the order of 10 years, but, but obviously a very exciting project to, to be a part of, uh, with the beautiful experimental results from, uh, from Andre. Um, these were testable predictions, including, for example, the non-monotonic conductivity, um, which, uh, which was borne out in the, in the laboratory. And we're really excited to see what we can do uh, in the case of films. And this is a case where the, these experiments are really leading the theory. In order to be able to you know, determine or, or uh, segregate between different field theories for this particular transition, we really needed these excellent experiments. Uh, so the slides for this talk are going to be posted online. You can also find them on my website. Um, our codes are available on GitHub and, and uh, you can find this work on, uh, find me talking about science on Twitter. Thank you.